Welcome to Season 2 of Purdue University College of Sciences Superheroes of Science Podcast. I'm Stephen. And I'm Sarah. We will be discussing anything and everything related to science. If you have a science question, tweet it to us at Purdue SOS, and we will try and find someone to answer it for you. Joining us today on Superheroes of Science is Professor David Sanders. Um, David is an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Purdue University. So welcome. Glad to be here. Thank you. Yes, we, we certainly appreciate you taking the time. And uh, I, I was looking uh, at your faculty page uh, earlier today, and uh, it had a, I noticed it, it's like gene therapy and things like that. Uh, yes. Start by kind of explaining what some of your research is. It, it sounds very intriguing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. So uh, when we're talking about gene therapy, what we're talking about is bringing in things called nucleic acids, things that are genes, uh, DNA or RNA, into cells in order to produce some sort of therapeutic benefit, in order to treat some disease. People frequently think of gene therapy as being used to treat a genetic disease, such as sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis. But it turns out you can use gene therapy for other things. You can use gene therapy for uh, introducing genes to try to uh, stop cancer. Or you can use gene therapy uh, in something that's uh, of current interest to try to uh, introduce genes so that they can generate an immune response, for example, against a coronavirus. So all these different approaches can be used uh, through gene therapy. So what we specifically work on is using viruses as a delivery vehicle for those nucleic acids. And the reason that you wanna use viruses is that they've perfected the technique of bringing in nucleic acids in the cells. We've only been doing that chemically for about 70 years. The viruses have been doing it forever. And so uh, the idea is to instead of having the viruses transmit their own genes, their own nucleic acids, uh, we have them, we modify them, so they transfer the genes that we want them uh, to transfer. And the specific work that we have been doing in our laboratory is to change the outside of the virus that's doing the, the delivery process. And by changing the outside, uh, we can target the virus to particular cells. So any virus has a specificity for particular cells. Some of them want to go into uh, white blood cells. Some of them might want to go into liver cells. Other ones might want to go into cells in the brain. Other ones might want to go into the respiratory tract. Uh, but we can change the targeting of the virus by changing the protein that's on the outside. So we have invented some techniques to do that, do, do that and modified viruses in order to allow that to be possible. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> like, how, do you, how do you even begin going through and you said changing the protein on the outside? I think viruses are really small, right? So how do right. you, how do you, so what, yeah, do it. so what you do is uh, you create a cell that can potentially make a virus, but you strip away the protein that is normally on the outside of the virus. So the, the cell can continue to make these modified viruses. Now, we, we modify them for safety. They can't reproduce themselves. So they can enter a cell, they can bring in nucleic acid, but they can't make more of themselves. So that's one modification. But the other modification, just to start, is to eliminate the protein on the outside. And then we replace it from, with a protein from a different virus that targets the particular cells that we want to target. So for example, uh, we made a virus that on the inside looks like something called a retrovirus. Uh, retroviruses are not called retroviruses because they dress like they're in the 70s. They're called, re they're called retroviruses uh, because they do something which is a, a bit backwards. Uh, they 
just for technical purposes, they go backwards from RNA to DNA. But what's more important is that when they enter a cell, they can leave the nucleic acid and that nucleic acid, that gene becomes permanently incorporated into the target cell. So we can make this virus, can't make more of itself, and we can eliminate the protein on the other side. And what, one thing that we did was to replace that protein with the protein on the outside of the Ebola virus. So we don't have Ebola virus, the whole Ebola virus at Purdue. I'm not working with the whole Ebola virus. I'm just working with this one protein and using it as the shell for this delivery vehicle. And that allows us to target uh, particular cells. And I mentioned cystic fibrosis before. It turns out that these particular viruses with Ebola on the outside um, had particular capacity to, en uh, to enter uh, lung ep uh, airway epithelium where you would want to target the gene delivery in order to cure cystic fibrosis. So those are the sorts of things uh, that we can do. They, I refer to them as mix and match viruses uh, because we, we take certain capacities from one and certain capacities from the other and we combine them to allow for the delivery of viruses to uh, particular cells. Oh, wow. yeah, that is, that's mind blowing. First of all, thank you for clarifying that you don't have like live bullet virus <laughs> on campus. You just saved me a bunch of emails. Uh, <laughs> but, and it, so what type of, what type of equipment uh, it, would I expect to see in a lab where you're doing, I mean, to strip away proteins, I mean, it's, it's, it, well, obviously not my area, so it's beyond my, what I understand. So uh, help me. <laughs> sure. So um, all of this is done in cells in what's called cell culture. So what we do is to um, breed cells and we introduce the genetic material for the viruses into those cells. And then we allow those cells to grow and then we collect the uh, viruses that those cells uh, will produce. So it happens that retroviruses um, don't actually, in the, in the process of infection and production, don't actually harm the cells that they're being produced in, generally. You can just have the cells grow and the viruses just emerge from the cells into the medium, the liquid, that is feeding the cells. And so you can just collect that liquid and then incubate it, um, put it you know, with some other cells, and then those viruses will now enter those second cells and bring in the nucleic acid. So we work with, we work with what are called cell culture hoods. Uh, we collect viruses through processes of centrifugation and filtration. Uh, we check the viruses through processes uh, that we refer to as immunoblots and we look at nucleic acids through processes like the polymerase chain reaction, PCR, um, other types of ana anal uh, an analyses of uh, nucleic acids. And then we check on whether the cells have been, um, what's, it's, not, it's, it's not actually infection because we're not producing new viruses, it's called transduction, but in any case, that the viruses have entered the cell, we use a variety of techniques including something called uh, flow cytometry. Uh, we can, uh, one of the things that we do just to test the viruses is to have them bring in a gene that encodes something that will literally change the color of the cell. Uh, one of the things that we frequently bring in just to test to make sure that the virus is working correctly is something called the green fluorescent protein. It's a protein from the uh, jellyfish Aquaria Victoria. Uh, this technology um, was actually under, underlay the, uh, a Nobel Prize in chemistry a few years ago. And what happens is when this gene goes into a cell and the protein from that gene is produced, if you shine a laser on that cell um, at a particular wavelength, they will fluoresce green. That's why it's called the green fluorescent protein. And so that's another, so we use a variety of techniques and that's, 
you know, a standard uh, laboratory nowadays doesn't just rely on one particular technique. There is many different types of techniques that are um, looking at things at the cellular level, at the molecular level. Sometimes you're looking at intact cells. Sometimes you're breaking open the cells to look at what happened. Uh, so we do use uh, a large variety of techniques to uh, examine this process. Wow. Okay, sir. I, I didn't. Know, I, was, I didn't want to interrupt you. I, I listened to no. one of our last ones, and I'm like, I think I interrupted her several times. So I'm like, oh, so I don't. <laughs> but, Hard with the delay. And so, uh, what, one of the things I'm always curious about because uh, I mean, this is this seems like higher level biology. This doesn't seem like you know uh, something my high school kids are going to be doing here tomorrow. And so, what what biology do they need to understand in a really good way before you would get to the level where you're doing gene, literally doing gene therapy? It's a, it's a great question. I actually did run a, an undergraduate class where people were using these techniques for studying. Now, um, we, can, we can actually, as I said, design these viruses extremely safely. Uh, the main issue is not um, the safety uh, issue per se, it's actually trying to prevent contamination of the cells. And so we have to train students uh, in, in that. But it's, it's not, the, the, the techniques that we've developed are you know, robust, straightforward, and can be uh, readily applied. And so uh, which, the sorts of things that you want to do to be able to, uh, be able to conduct these experiments you know, uh, yourself eventually, I mean, you want to have a basic understanding of the nature of viruses, the nature of nucleic acids uh, and genes, how cells work. Uh, it's, th it's those sorts of fundamental um, concepts uh, that you need to have and be able to uh, develop. The most difficult uh, parts in terms of technique is just to try to make sure that everything is sterile. Uh, the cells are very sensitive to, for example, bacterial contamination. Our cells um, are really, you know, they're actually very large, uh, by, by evolutionary origin, they're actually very large um, bacterial cells, uh, but they grow much more slowly than a typical bacterial cell. Typical cell that I'm working on, it only divides every 16 hours, every 24 hours, something like that. A bacterial cell can divide every 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So you can see that if you have any sort of bacterial contamination, it can outgrow uh, the cells very, very rapidly. And bacterial contamination uh, damages the cells and therefore makes them less likely to produce the viruses that we want and causes other uh, consequences. So that's the, really the trickiest uh, technical part. Uh, but the other, there are other techniques, as I was mentioning, um, where we are separating uh, proteins and nucleic acids out. And these are ones which uh, can be readily learned by high school students, uh, for example. And uh, I have participated in programs where we train uh, high school students to do these, to these, do these sorts of techniques. And they're, they're qu quite fun. A lot of stuff. Wow. Is that like the strawberry DNA type things, act labs I've seen? Is that similar to that? Yes. I mean, though, that's how you obtain the, that's how you obtain the original uh, material. But you can, one of the, the techniques that we use most often in the laboratory when we're analyzing either nucleic acids or proteins is to put these things in an electric field and to separate them out, uh, to separate them out by size. It turns out that we can uh, take a sort of jelly, a, a gel, and by putting the proteins or the nucleic acids at one side and running a um, running a uh, electric field through the gel, we can separate things out by size. And it's a very simple technique because what happens is small things can sort of slide through the gel faster, whereas large things tend to get hung up and it, it's it's harder for them to get through this this passage you can think of there there are, there are holes of different sizes the small things can get through really fast and the large things you know don't get through 
uh, nearly as fast. And so we can separate things by size and uh, we have other techniques once we've separated things to figure out what is what. And these are techniques, again, that um, many high school labs can now uh, put into place. Oh, wow. That's really great. It's so you're not like working with people like directly. You're not, you know, a, one of the biologists pulling things off of people and stuff, I'm assuming. Uh, That's correct. I work with other people who obtain. So if I want to get access to certain viral things, I work with people who obtain them and then share them with me. And uh, in terms of the viruses that I've developed, I have worked with physicians and other people are working with my viruses. Um, I don't think any of them per se are being used in human, uh, human patients, but they have been used in animal models. I don't do that work myself. I'm, I do the basic uh, biology on the viruses, but people have been working with uh, animal models to try to uh, treat disease. And so collaboration wise then, what all, uh, you're um, a, okay, gene therapist. What, who all does a gene therapist collaborate with on a regular basis and kind of why do you collaborate at different levels with these different people? Sure, so the people who are conducting the animal experiments, for example, are mostly physicians. Okay. Uh, they are present at medical schools frequently and uh, so they have a particular medical interest, but they want to do what are called preclinical studies with the animals. And they want, so they, uh, I develop viruses. I provide advice about what's the best way to use them. We work on collaborative projects to try to figure out which cells can be most readily targeted. And, you know, we, we discuss issues, for example, if you take the virus and inject it into the bloodstream, well, it'll target particular cells. If you inject it into the central nervous system, it'll target other cells. So, uh, you know, we discuss mode of delivery, how we're going to detect the viruses. And also uh, there's a, a feedback loop because we figure something out and then we say, OK, what if we change the virus slightly? Uh, is that going to change the cells that it affects or the efficiency with which it works and so on? So there's a, a constant uh, discussion about trying to improve uh, the viruses. Uh, we just published in this, uh, this last year uh, an, an article about doing exactly that, changing the virus. So we had, um, we had one virus on the inside, another virus on the outside, and we changed that protein on the outside to uh, change which types of cells uh, it would enter. And that was a successful experiment. So uh, that's how these things work. That's really great. So I, I had a question. And speaking of publications, I noticed that it looks like also one of your interests is in the ethics of scientific publications. Yes. And when I was in the classroom with high school students, I, I tried to talk about that several times every year because I think that's a really important thing to, to introduce to, to young people, um, really even before they get into the, the collegiate setting. So sure. uh, what sorts of things do you look at with, with ethics and publications? That's a great question. And I'll just mention, uh, since the laboratory is closed now, uh, I have been focusing and I've been writing quite a bit on this. And I have a number of things which are uh, have just recently come out and will be coming out in the near future on exactly those issues because uh, those are the things I have uh, available uh, to me at, <laughs> at the time. I can write about these things. So I'm interested in issues about the integrity of the scientific literature, how the scientific literature is generated, how what's called peer review works. So if I could just step back for a minute and discuss uh, how is it that a scientific publication um, occurs. I mean, what, what's the process? So first, um, I'm not going to go through the whole scientific method, but one does experiments and one creates a, a manuscript, which is a first attempt to try to publish this uh, information. So you want to share it. Right? Doing science and not telling anybody about it doesn't really do any good. You need to be sharing that uh, with uh, your fellow scientists and with the public at large. Uh, so you create this, this manuscript and then that is submitted to what's called a journal. It is a scientific publication uh, where they publish articles like the ones that you want to publish. Sometimes you send it to a, 
uh, one that's specific to your field. Uh, for example, mine might be virology. Uh, that is the study of viruses. So I might send it to a journal that specializes in that. Or you might send it to a journal that has more broad uh, interests. That is then sent to what's called an editor. And what he has to do is to find people who are going to read and evaluate that manuscript to make sure that the science is good and that it fits with the, uh, the interests of that journal. So he finds what are called peer reviewers. And those are supposed to be experts in the field. And they are supposed to read the article and decide, you know, is this good? Is it not good? Does, how does it need to be improved? Those sorts of things. And those comments go back to the author and then the author corrects things, so on and so forth. There are two eventual outcomes. It could be that the reviewers and the editor decide this just isn't very good science or it's not appropriate for our journal or there isn't enough data to support the conclusions. We're not going to publish it. Or the conclusion can be we're going to publish it. All right. Where does the ethics enter into this? Well, one thing is, of course, that the science has to be true and correct and an accurate representation of the experiments that were performed. So there are ways of measuring those things. And I, so I discuss those issues. Another issue is in the peer review process. The peer reviewers are supposed to be rigorously scrutinizing the data to make sure that it supports the conclusions, that uh, all of the images are authentic and haven't been manipulated in any way. That all that, and one makes a commitment when one is publishing uh, that this data, these data haven't been published before, either by the authors or by somebody else, and that the text hasn't been published before or after. So, uh, all of these and all of these elements have to go into an ethical approach. Another thing is that this peer review process is confidential. That means that. If you get an article to review, you can't read the data or the, the text or something and then use it by, for yourself. You are making a commitment when you agree to peer review that you're going to um, you're going to treat this material as confidential. You're not going to share it with others and you're not going to use it for yourself. And so I'm, tr I'm trying to provide uh, guidelines and ways for people to think about these issues uh, to prevent violations of um, uh, scientific integrity. It seems like it, sometimes that might be hard to do because once you read something, it's going to bias what you think in your next movement of your research. If you're doing something close to what I'm doing and I read something you've done, either I really liked it or I didn't like maybe the way you did it, but I would think that's going to then impact and affect how I'm going to think about my next experiment. That's a great, that's a great comment, and it's absolutely true. Uh, what I do try to do is to provide uh, ways to safeguard. One of my most recent articles, just accepted, <laughs> is providing people with some safeguards against uh, engaging in some of these uh, practices, even inadvertently. And so uh, we can clearly, I mean, one of the things, there are ideas. One could be influenced by the ideas. Uh, but when we, we are, there are examples in the literature where people are actually reproducing the data per se or the text per se that they've received in privileged manner. And so that's absolutely, you know, unacceptable. You can't, uh, you can't do that. The ideas, it's more difficult. Um, it's more difficult to trace, but certainly uh, you, it, when you're talking about obtaining those ideas, it shouldn't be that you publish or use those ideas before the person who submitted the original manuscript has a chance to do that. So the, the, the yeah. ability to publish, I mean, manuscripts can be published, especially through electronic means, fairly rapidly nowadays. And it's important for people who first came up with an idea to be able to get the credit uh, yeah. for that. And right. so one shouldn't, for example, read an article uh, take the idea and then say, oh, this article shouldn't be published, right? That's not, that's not an acceptable approach. These things, 
all of these things are not common, all right? This is not happening like all the time. You know, people aren't doing this all the time, but it does happen and it's important for uh, people to be aware of this and to take the proper action when it, when it does happen on the, on the infrequent occasions that it does happen. It's important for people to take the right action. Hey, you know, that's a big thing. It's, these things are, aren't things that are common in the community, but the scientists are people and yes. with, with pressures just like everyone else. And so temptations and stuff of maybe doing something like that does happen. And it's possible that on rare occasions, you said these things could happen. That's correct. And so I'd, I think that's an excellent thing to be uh, discussing, uh, not only with scientists, but with students. Uh, because Absolutely. students understand how different biases and how different uh, things that uh, aren't quite savvy that uh, could happen. And we want them to think about those and make sure that uh, they're not falling into that, that accidentally falling into that kind of um, mindset. That's I think cool. students and, and that's too one, have it. One of the most important things that I try to do is to provide people with the tools to avoid those pitfalls, especially to students. I want to reach out to younger students, you know, at all levels and try to advise them how they can avoid um, making these sorts of mistakes. Yeah. I think students generally, when I've spoken with them too, I think they just think, oh, well, so they're scientists. They're, they're just gonna do what's right and do the, you know, and it's not a, there are no scientific police. And I, and so I think that it's important to understand that process, you know, it's, as early as possible to introduce that to them. So I agree fully. And most most scientists are doing it for the right reasons and are, mm -hmm. are it's it's a very small it's a, it's a small percentage that are doing it. But it's important for everybody because we want the we want the playing field to be fair for everybody. We want people who have done the work to get the credit for that work. Um, and we want um, you know people to feel confident that the science that they're hearing about is in fact correct. And I think, again, uh, in the period that we're in, that's more important than ever, that correct uh, science, that correctly attributed science, people need to know where is this science coming from? And that's an important ethical uh, component to it. You know, who's, co who's conducting the science? How, when was the science conducted? You know, all those things are, are really very important for understanding the validity of uh, science and that's more important now than ever oh definitely well thank you this has been very awesome from gene therapy to ethics and science and uh, we we covered a gamut here and uh, this is this has been a really good interview we again we really thank you for your time and thank you for Absolutely. this we appreciate it well yeah, thank, thank you. you very much for the opportunity to to speak with you and to speak with everybody who's going to hear this and see this Thank you for listening to our podcast. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. An outstanding on review. On iTunes or your preferred podcast player. Tweet us your science questions. At Purdue SOS. Until next time, be super. And remember. You are someone's hero. Boiler up. Hammer down.